Hi, my name is Dr. Scott Stevens. I am one of the neurologists and epileptologists here at Northwell Health. In addition, I am the Chief of Education for Neurology and the Neurology Clerkship Director at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Today we're going to be talking about marijuana and the management of epilepsy. Many medications exist for epilepsy. Until the early 90s, there were only a few, but as we can see here, it exponentially increased over the years. However, no matter how many medicines we have, how many new medications come to the market, patients still continue to have seizures. Our job as epileptologists is to figure out what to do for patients when the medications fail. When anti-seizure medications don't work, patients have a few options once they're labeled as having either refractory epilepsy or intractable epilepsy. Many times we refer our patients for epilepsy surgery. We might make dietary modifications such as the ketogenic diet or use neurostimulation, which are devices used to control epilepsy. However, something else that we're going to talk about today is the use of cannabidiol in our patients with epilepsy. Now, the use of marijuana medically is not something that's new. It's been used for centuries, millennia, actually. It's actually been used for epilepsy since the 1800s. However, laws against it, which started in the early 1900s, made it a little difficult to study, which is why it hasn't come into play until recently. It was classified in 1970 as a Schedule I drug, which limited research on its use in many medical ailments, including epilepsy. So why is it now that we're talking about it? In 2013, Dr. Sanjay Gupta had a CNN special entitled Weed, which talked about the use of cannabis, mainly the use of cannabidiol in epilepsy. Cannabis actually has two separate kinds of plants. There's the indica, which is mainly cannabidiol content, the one that we'll be talking about today, and the sativa, which is THC heavy, which is not the one we'll be talking about for its use in epilepsy. The main things to know are the one that's THC heavy has more psychogenic effects. Those are the ones that give the so-called high when people talk about marijuana. When we look at high levels of CBD in the indica, what you'll notice is many times you'll have sedation, a calming effect, and sometimes the treatment of anxiety as well. What's found in cannabis are many, many hundreds of cannabinoids. The two that we focus on that we're talking about are THC and cannabidiol. However, many more exist. It's hard to get a pure extract that's 100% cannabidiol or 100% THC. However, for the compounds used in epilepsy, we try to have as pure as possible compound containing mainly cannabidiol. We know that there are many receptors all over the brain which respond to the different cannabinoids. We know a little about how THC works, but the use of cannabidiol, what receptors it binds to, how it exactly works, is still largely unknown. The reason we talk about this now is because of a little girl named Charlotte Figgy, who was born in 2006. Unfortunately, she did pass away last year in 2020. Charlotte Figgy was a young girl who suffered from something called Dravet syndrome, a severe infantile myoclonic epilepsy. She was tried on numerous anti-seizure medications, all which failed her and she continued to seize. She also noted developmental regression was not doing well overall. Her father actually researched the use of marijuana in the treatment of epilepsy. And as noted before, it's not something new. We've been using marijuana for epilepsy since the 1800s. 
he actually found a marijuana farm slash dispensary owned by the Stanley brothers. Most people at that time wanted THC extracts, and they had a large amount of a CBD extract which was used in Charlotte. This later became known as Charlotte's Web. When she started taking the medicine, she was found to have a large reduction in seizures and was actually taken off the feeding tube after a few months. However, after this was put in the media, families started making their own dangerous extractions. Moving across country, since only a few states at that time were approved for medical marijuana, and many children unfortunately did pass away during those journeys. And other dispensaries started making their own versions with no quality control, because at this point, it wasn't something that was well known or mass produced so that there was no one monitoring it. So the question is, yes, it worked for Charlotte, but what's the evidence for it? Until recently, we only had a few animal studies which showed that cannabis and THC can have anti-convulsant effects in some animals, yet were pro-convulsant in other animals. CBD, on the other hand, was largely anti-convulsant in many animal models, but there was limited data on animals even with chronic epilepsies. The reason for this, that it was only a few studies in animals, is that there was restrictions, once it was classified as a narcotic, for research of marijuana. There were only four controlled studies, mainly in the 1970s until more recently, which studied its use in epilepsy. There were a few case series reports, some surveys, but nothing that had good evidence. In addition to not having enough evidence, there is lack of regulation and standardization since medical marijuana is from many different dispensaries, that there's no FDA approved form until more recently, which we'll discuss. So it's unclear what dose to use, what form to use. Should it be inhaled, smoked, vaped? Should it be sublingual, put under the tongue? What composition should be using CBD or THC? And a big question was that this is used in many children who still have developing brains. So what is the risk to the developing brain? In order to answer these questions, more research had to be done in the use of randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials so that we can actually study its effects The other question is, what about the cost? What we know when we give a patient medical marijuana, it's not covered by insurance. Yes, there's a certain form which we'll discuss, which is in prescription strength, but medical marijuana, which is gotten from the dispensaries, is not covered by insurance. It's still seen almost as if it's an herbal supplement. There was actually a study not too long ago which showed that if a patient tried to obtain the amount needed, which has been studied to control epilepsy, it would cost nearly $68,000 per year if obtained from a dispensary. And the reason for this is that there was no FDA approved version available until Epidiolex came on the market. Epidiolex is pharmaceutical strength cannabidiol which is known as one of our other anti-seizure medications. This is not obtained from a dispensary, but is actually a prescription that you get from your doctor. It's mainly been studied for use and approved in only certain type of epilepsies, notably Dravet syndrome, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, tuberous sclerosis complex. It was first approved for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome back in 2018, and tuberous sclerosis complex just last year in 2020. As for the other epilepsies, it has not yet received approval and is only on label for the three conditions noted above. The early studies of Epidiolex showed that there were interactions between Epidiolex and other medicines. Yes, although it's marijuana, it still does have interactions with other anti-seizure medicines, so that it should be viewed as being another anti-seizure medicine. 
the initial open label trials in which patient knew what they were getting were extremely positive. But always take that with a grain of salt. When a patient knows what they're getting, there can be placebo effect from it too. It was noted that it was not side effect free. People had somnolence, labs needed to be tested. People had gastrointestinal upset. And what was found is that randomized, double-blind, once again, placebo-controlled trials needed to be done. So these were done initially for Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. What was found when looking at this in patients using 20 milligrams per kilogram per day, randomized to either getting Epidiolex or placebo, there was a significant reduction in seizures in those patients who received Epidiolex versus placebo. This was also found in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, that there was a significant reduction in seizures for those receiving Epidiolex versus those receiving placebo. However, once again, it was not side effect free. Fatigue, interactions with other medications and GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, were found with this compound. So what's next? We know that Epidiolex was approved for the treatment of epilepsy in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome. We also know that it was approved for the treatment of seizures in tuberous sclerosis complex. But what about the other epilepsies our patients suffer from? In order to know how it can be used in these seizure disorders, we need more research. And in order to have more research, we need to fix the legal issue. However, the legal issue is very complicated since it's a scale, a scale of state versus federal law. We know that there are many states where medical marijuana and recreational marijuana are legal, such as New York. However, on the federal side of the scale, it's still seen as a Schedule I narcotic and illegal. Until we can fix the balance of state and federal law, making it legal on both sides, we're unable to fully research it to the best of our potential. There are current bills to amend the Controlled Substance Act to exclude medical marijuana that are being worked on now. If this happens, it will eliminate the fear of federal prosecution, allow for interstate transport, reclassify marijuana as a Schedule II narcotic instead of an illicit substance, and importantly, also increase tax revenue. All of this will allow for more research on marijuana and the use of many medical disorders, including seizures. In New York, in 2014, the Compassionate Care Act was passed, making New York the 23rd state to legalize medical marijuana. At the time, you had to have a severe condition and an associated complication. For epilepsy, the condition would be epilepsy, and the complication would be seizures. What this means is that if there's a patient with epilepsy who's not currently seizing, this isn't something we would use. It's not something that would replace the other anti-seizure medications, but would be used more in refractory, intractable patients who are continuing to seize. For the patients in which it would be used, they would be enrolled in a New York State medical marijuana program. At the time, there's still a smaller number of dispensaries and manufacturers for marijuana, and the patient's physicians register with the state. In New York, as mentioned, it's legal for all, but not yet sold recreationally. They're trying to figure out regulation in addition to how it would be taxed. Once that is determined, then it would be sold in a recreational manner too. So given all this, some final thoughts is that there's still limited research available. Yes, there were studies, but we have to remember they were done by GW Pharmaceuticals those who brought us Epidiolex. More studies need to be done on the compound, and that will happen if we can change federal law to legalize it for use as a Schedule II medication instead of an illicit Schedule I substance. 
also to note that the higher doses are the ones that were shown to work. That means low doses such as hemp oils, even the amount found at a dispensary, doesn't have good evidence to support its use in epilepsy. Updating the federal scheduling and allowing for more research will allow us to look into this more. It's also important to note that it can be extremely costly if we get it from a dispensary. Yes, there's a prescription strength Epidiolex, which will be covered likely by insurance, but the type that we get from dispensaries, which can be used in all different type of epilepsies, still does come from out-of-pocket costs. What I want to look at it as is that we have another tool in our utility belts for the treatment of epilepsy. Not the holy grail of treating epilepsy, but another tool that we have for treating epilepsy. I'd like to end this with some questions that we usually get from our patients for discussion. Many patients come and say, Dr. Stevens, isn't this natural? as opposed to those chemicals that you're giving me, such as the anti-seizure medicines. So isn't this safer than other medications for epilepsy? To which I'd say, I'd like to think of it as another medication for epilepsy. As mentioned before, the dose needed for the treatment of epilepsy is very high. When it's used at those high doses, it was not side effect free. It can interact with other medications. We also have to monitor labs just like we do with our other seizure medicines. So yes, it is natural, but it should still be viewed as another anti-seizure medicine, which has its risks and has its benefits. Also, just because something natural doesn't always mean that it's perfectly safe. For instance, things such as poison ivy, snake venom, those are natural, but doesn't necessarily mean they're safe. We always have to look at the risks and benefits of anything we use, whether it's manufactured or whether it's natural. The second question we get often is what about CBD oil from the health food store or online? It's cheap, it's easy to get. And what I tell the patients is it hasn't been proven to work in epilepsy. Once again, high doses of CBD are what have been proven to work. Extremely low doses found in hemp have not been shown to work. Some patients do feel better with this and it's unclear whether there can be an effect or if there's a placebo effect, but that the most important part is there's no clear evidence that it does work at those, those low doses. And the final question is, that's great, say the patients, it works in Lennox Gusteau, it looks in, works in Dravet, but what about my seizure disorder? What about what I have? Will it work in that? Right now it is only approved, Epidiolex at least, for three different seizure disorders mentioned before. It has not yet been approved for all epilepsies. What we hope is with decreased regulation on the federal level and increased research, we can learn more about cannabidiol and its use in epilepsy to provide our patients with even better treatments and to fight against epilepsy. Thank you.